I think the Christian community has a great opportunity today to really help change the climate. You know the myth that the white man is inherently superior to the black man? This myth has plagued us for such a long time. I was given an assignment by the Lutheran churches of this country to uh, try to, um, to create a film that would be helpful in the midst of the counterculture revolution and in the civil rights revolution and to help the people in congregations the better to understand what the obligations are. He said, we'd like you to do a film on the church's response to racial tension. Little did we know at the time that what we were able to produce was actually very um, stimulating for a time of change. Black can be beautiful yes. if it will be. Yes. Black is beautiful if it is striving and developing integrity and developing its mind. And I think that it was a mirror to a lot of people in our churches and elsewhere that there was a lot of hidden bias and racial tension and racial discrimination that wasn't on the surface. If 10 couples would uh, take the time and the trouble to go into a Negro home which would be with a sister church. I would see um, an interracial exchange of couples uh, as uh, something sponsored or encouraged by our social ministry committee to actually promote better human relations. We're not running around proselyting Negro members. We simply want the understanding because of the fact they are in our community. I said, I don't write scripts. And he said, well, we always write scripts. How will we know what, you're going, what we're going to get for our money? And I said, the answer is you don't know. And I don't know. So that, to me, filmmaking is an act of faith. In 100 years, we, the Social Ministry Committee has done nothing, and I'm now we start out with the most controversial issue we could. Well, Ray, there are many other things we could look for and find to do, but is there anything more important, any problem more crucial right now? I was sold on the basis of uh, cinema verite, as they called it then, where uh, the camera gets what it can, and then the people who are being filmed become familiar with it, and they see the camera persons who are making the film as a part of their community at the time. I'm not going to give you a chance to discuss it anymore. I'm simply going to ask you how you vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, okay so tomorrow night at the council meeting, we'll see what kind of reaction we get. And as a result of that, we felt we got much more honesty than if we'd scripted lines or asked them to prepare certain predetermined uh, statements and all that. And it worked. I wanted to do a film in the middle of America, middle America uh, quote unquote. And um, we looked around and I found a minister in Omaha, Nebraska, Bill Yondol, and he worked for the Lutheran Church in civil rights. So I thought this guy has, I hope or assume, some sort of an agenda. And he's at a 1,000 member all white church in Omaha, Nebraska. Now an all white church in Omaha, Nebraska, and an active participant in civil rights from Orange, New Jersey, don't tell me that that's going to just be nothing. Something's going to happen, I'm sure. What kind of attitudes are you sharing with others, your friends, your children, when it comes to race relations? What is your race relations vocabulary? I've heard so many Christians use the word nigger by what we say, by how we act, we teach, we witness. He said, well, I don't know why you want to do a film here. Nothing's happening in Omaha, he said. Uh, and I said, I think there is something happening. The question is whether we're noticing it and what we're going to do about it. That congregation in Omaha, Nebraska at Augustana Lutheran Church, I don't know if they knew what they were getting into. But they were very cooperative and very brave, I must say, in being willing to, uh, to let the dirty linen hang out, so to speak. Nice to see you again. The few particulars that make Omaha different from New York are just incidental. The problem exists because white people think they're better than black people and they want to oppress us and they want us to allow ourselves to be oppressed. I wanted somebody who was really going to express the feelings of black people in Omaha. 
which I said, is there anybody in the area that you think can really express uh, what it means to be black in this community? He said, why don't you just go across the street to the barber shop and talk to Ernie Chambers? You guys pull the strings at closed schools. You guys draw the boundaries that keep our kids restricted to the ghetto. You guys write up the restrictive covenants that keep us out of houses. So it's up to you to talk to your brothers and your sisters and persuade them that they have a responsibility. We've assumed ours for over 400 years. One of the things that's so great about Time for Burning is that it's the first time you see you taking inside a black barber shop to see the kind of social discourse that goes on there. Right now, it's a cliche. Ricky, what, what, what the hell you think you're doing over there? Hey, look, I'm just trying to get them clean like them Gillette commercials, you know? But this is one of the first times you got to see something like that. And I thought it was a really shrewd and savvy thing to do. And to do it in a place like Nebraska, which is a very different place than the rest of the country. Right. Everybody's got something, something to fight for. Why should he go over there and fight the Vietnamese? They've done nothing to him. Okay, right in this own country, he can go places and he can't even get in a hotel. Have you ever been turned away from a hotel by a Vietnamese? No, no, by a Chinese? No, a Japanese? No, a Korean? No, a Lebanese? No. How about a white man? Yeah. Then if we should fight, we should fight the man who's hurting us and a white man is one and he lives no. in this country. They came to the barber shop because the mayor had been talked to and he said there's a young, I don't know what he referred to me as, at a barber shop, and if you go talk to him, he will either, he said, curl their hair or straighten their hair. So I think they came down to see me as a curio. That's why people looked at us in those days. I didn't expect I'd find somebody like Ernie Chambers. One rarely does. You could walk around and talk to people, stand up in your pulpit on Sunday and preach nice little songs and say, now we're gonna give thanks to the Lord for he is good and old Jesus be among us. As far as we're concerned, your Jesus is contaminated, just like everything else you tried to force upon us is contaminated. Mm -hmm. The sheer force of intellect, uh, along with that, that sheer kind of intransigence, where you know, he dared you to take him off his argument. It was just the most exciting thing I've ever seen in my life. You know, this in the days when, you know, Sidney Poitier was in movies by himself, or you had to be, you know, Jim Brown with two big guns to, to scare white people and see this guy fight sheer dint of reason making this pastor who wanted to connect with him sweat like he was being interrogated was a pretty magical thing to see and it felt so honest too because this is a documentary about a, a country still trying to find its way with race he said there were things he was trying to do to address the race problem and when he told me what he was doing it was funny to me he said I am the pastor of Augustana Lutheran Church and there is a black church, and I and the pastor have talked to each other. It's a Lutheran church, too. And what we're planning to do is have parishioners in my church meet parishioners in his church in each other's homes and talk and get to know each other. I said, you have no idea of the kind of place Omaha is. There are people who come from the South and find things worse here than where they came from. As mild as this thing is that you're talking about, it's not going to work. You can talk to those racists in your church, and on the basis of what you say to them and what you're talking about trying to do, they'll kick you out of your church. I think the problem is so bad that we can have no understanding at all. You think it's gotten to the point where there can never be that reconciliation? Then? No. And you can accept it or not any way you choose. And for you, this may be an excursion, you know, in, what, across what, the what line. About the person that wants to listen, I genuinely feel that I want to listen. Well, if you listen and try to do something, you get kicked out of your church. See, that's, that's the way your people are. I believe in being a participant observer. I think it's irresponsible of me simply to record what happens in the ostensible cinema verite approach because that makes the assumption that what happened in front of your camera is truth with a capital T. No, it's the facts of what happened that time. But the fundamental truth about that relationship, that person, was not necessarily revealed in that moment. So here's a sequence I have with Ernie Chambers and Bill Youngdahl arguing over the nature of the church, the nature of black-white relationships, and Bill Youngdahl is brilliant. He's loving, he's caring, he has a comment on everything Ernie says, and they're all good comments and none of them are in the film. 
I felt my responsibility was to tell the truth about that moment in time. The truth about that moment in time was not that there were two equally articulate, intelligent, caring people presenting their point of view like a ping pong game back and forth, and one side was as good as the other, more or less. No, that wasn't the truth. The truth was that Bill Young Doyle, because he cared, felt the anger that Ernie Chambers and the pain that Ernie Chambers was representing. And because he felt that, he was uncomfortable and he sweat. So that's what the sequence is about. God bless you, little brother. Come back and see us again sometime. And don't look back in anger. Ernie Chambers is a figure out of American literature. He's a figure out of Faulkner. At the time, again, and still in documentaries, it's a rarity to see a composed African-American figure who's not a politician, who's not famous, who hasn't written a book, who isn't published, who can stand and speak his or her mind and have you immediately understand who they are, but also that sense of, I will not be moved, I will not be bowed, and not somebody who's looking for a fight, but somebody who creates a space around him um, by virtue of his intelligence and concentration and says, this is what I think. One of the interviews or reviews that was given of the film was in Life magazine, and I was described as an astonishingly articulate person. What astonished them was not what I said. It was not astonishing. What I said to them was my ordinary manner of speaking. It astonished them because they have such a low regard and opinion for and of black people. And that's something we still see in documentaries about African Americans is that we're the subjects of patronization. You know, we think we can't get through a competently managed day without a, a social service infrastructure to help us out. And there was nothing like that in this film. These are people who knew what they thought, who knew what they wanted, and, um, and said it on, on both sides, black and white. Some people in the church, you know, said, well, I'll leave. I'm not going to condemn the whole church. I said, well, the persons who did it are rotten. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to hide the fact that I think, you know, they're wrong. And, well, they don't belong in, no, I'm not going to say they don't belong in a church because the church is well, a place to... Would you join a church learn. where you know you were upsetting the people? A church isn't really a show place for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And so if a person hates another person, where is he going to learn the opposite if it's not in church? We filmed in black and white because black and white negative was much faster, much more light sensitive than color film. And I knew I didn't want to do, use any lights. After all, we're invasive. When you bring that camera in, you bring that boom mic over, aim over people's heads, it's really invasive. You want to minimize the invasion of the privacy. Why be so revolutionary and, and upheaval and, and let's, let's take, uh, take one step at a time? Do you, th uh, do you think that this would be so... Uh... This would be so revolutionary and so uh, repugnant to them that we'd lose some people? That was all shot with one camera. So the business of covering 12 people interacting, knowing when to pan, when not to pan, is a real trick. Because you really have to decide why to stay on this person. You say, well, stay on because they're talking. No, not necessarily. Because you see what that guy's doing right now, or she's doing here, she's doing. Well, you, that's, film is a medium of reaction. It's not a medium of action. I realize what we're can involve ourselves with, but I also... You get the feeling he made this documentary, even though clearly it's made with a with the church, it was something he wanted to see, it was a story he wanted to tell, and if nobody else saw it, that was fine too. They, they figure and feel that this church might become integrated, and like Bob said, their exodus will be right out of here. They don't, they don't see why we should go and, and keep harping on this idea of civil rights. Uh, continually. If we do not start now as a church, the world is going to pass us by on the biggest issue of our lifetime. And I perhaps am being over dramatic when I suggest where were the people of Germany when the issue of the Jews came up? Where was the church, both Catholic and Lutheran? How did they answer it? And Walt, you say, let's take a step at a time. This is the smallest step we know, we know of.
dialogue, talking with one another, understanding. Let's not look back on history and say the church had nothing to do when the integration problem was around. To me, it's really about a young man, Ray Christensen, who at the end of the film says, where was the church when Hitler was doing what he did to the Jews? And, and then when people said to him, well, Ray, how much did you, what, are you, what have you done? And he says, who, me? I'm scared to death. Ray, how many colored folks have you brought into the church? Me, I'm scared to death that how the civil rights situation. law was passed. Right. It is a fact yeah. that it is against the law to close the doors of this church. We can be fined by the United States government or imprisoned for closing the doors to colored people today. Yeah. Can we not? Isn't Ray, this, the... this church doors will never be closed to colored people. Never. In our Physically, hearts, in our hearts. Exactly. So the message of the film is that unless we are willing to take positive actions in the presence of our fear, we won't bring about change. And the good news is we can take positive action in the presence of our fear. The film is still enormously important because it captures a moment, but it also captures a kind of cogent argument of people trying to figure out what their feelings are. And we don't see that anymore. I mean, what passes for documentary now is a kind of really heightened reality television. And, and this is a film where there's something at stake that still makes a lot of sense to us. I think you have a real obligation to get at the essence of the truth. And the truth in this, in fact, wasn't even about Ernie Chambers and Bill Youngdahl and Augustana Lutheran Church in Omaha, Nebraska. It was about how difficult it is to bring about change when situations, beliefs, attitudes, values, opinions are entrenched. Uh, enough of the people, I think, in this congregation uh, now are suspicious. This is not good. What are they suspicious of, well, Matt? I suspect they think now that this is a forced integration, and this is not good. What is a forced I, integration? I don't get what you... A forced integration is going out, I suspect, and taking someone, bringing him in, just to say that now we are integrated, now we can brag. We don't want to do this, and I don't feel that this is back of it, but I think the feeling is there. Well, this would not be bringing uh, uh, groups of uh, Negroes into worship with us. This would be exchange in the homes. Right. But you see, um, the climate is not good right now, if I would read the congregation correctly. We look at strangers, and they behave in ways that we find uncomfortable. And so we therefore treat them in a certain way. Then they see us treating them in a certain way, and they, so it, 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 our discomfort with differences that we feel are threatening escalates until we monsterize them, and then of course the only appropriate thing for us to do is be a monster ourselves. Some may feel very defensive. They feel a need to argue with what's going on in the film and justify themselves and say, I'm not like them or I'm like them, but those white people were traitors because they shouldn't have exposed us like this. And my concern is the reaction of the congregation, how they're going to take this thing. I mean, that's my real concern. There's a church that we're thinking about celebrating its 100th anniversary, and we're wondering if it's going to hold together through such a trial as 10 members visiting into the homes of 10 members of other churches that happen to be colored. A uh, hundred years of preaching, where has it gone? Where has it gone? I live near uh, Walt's church. Supposing one of our homes in this neighborhood becomes available and a family comes in and they can't meet it economically. So another Negro family moves in with them and all of a sudden we've got two or three families in a given house. Uh, nothing can lead uh, more quickly to the deterioration of neighborhood than multiple family residents in an area that's supposed to be single in family. In fact, right where I'm living, uh, we have uh, quite a few Mexicans that have, and uh, it, it's the same thing, the same problem that we we have with the colored people. I mean, their property deteriorates, looks, mm -hmm. looks uh, uh, bad. Unfortunately, racism continues to exist uh, in this country, and Ernie will probably say it's the same as it always was, and that's where he and I disagree. Um, I don't think in 1965 a black man by the name of Barack Obama would have been accepted even by my noble Democratic Party that I'm a longtime member of. I don't think so.
Little did I dream one week ago that I would resign as pastor of Augustana Lutheran Church. I was told that a group of members wanted a change of pastor. They indicated that this was not a case of liking or disliking the pastor. The word mismatch was used. In the case of that entire filmmaking, the experience of Young Doll, all it demonstrated is that racists do not change. They conceal what they are, but they all know what each other is, but they don't want others to see it. When they are offended at the way they appeared in that film, it's because what they really were came forth. I think here you're getting a true reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, they, um, they're responding uh, in what, from what they really feel. And I think uh, analyzing this, you'll come up with the answer as to what type of people you have in your church. It was my feeling that a time for burning, as it ended up, was one of those events that helped people to see themselves probably as they really were and to identify with the issues that um, racial tension and other similar uh, discriminatory um, ideas had. The fact is that it's 40 years later and that this conversation is still taking place. We're fighting ignorance in the place where there should be the most enlightenment. I have done as much as I know how to do, unless you can tell me some other things I can do <coughs> to change. I got laughed at by some. I got cold-shouldered by others. I got sneered at by others. I have not been spoken to by many people for years. And personally, I don't give a damn. But I'm simply telling you that's the way it is in Omaha, and that's the way it is in every place in this United States. Uh, and the reason you have so much frustration is that your own white people will not listen to you. And that's this just right. bears out what we say. I remember the 12-year-old in 1939 cheering for the Brooklyn Dodgers, best team ever on God's earth, and lost most of the time. So when the Dodgers were in the cellar, which is mainly they, where they occupied, when the Dodgers were in the cellar, if we win a game, we celebrate it as if it was the World Series. And that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about celebrating a radical change. We're just talking about celebrating a moment where somehow or other we're able to be with one another, openly and honestly. I saw a movie with John Voight. It was called Runaway Train. Voight was a prisoner, and he was kicking this other young prisoner, and this woman on the train that was running away saw it, and she was very upset. She said, you're an animal. He said, not an animal, human. Not less human. Human! No matter what, as a human being, we may have to contend with, deep down inside, may be carefully hidden, there can be a hope that things would be better. We know they should be better. Well, here's where we are. We've confessed our sins. We've tried to open up and say, doggone it, uh, we did this. We did do it. We're all guilty, terribly guilty. But what do we do now? Do we sit around in despair? If we do, then let's all knock ourselves off and, and get the heck off the earth. Or do we try to live together and work out a better life? What makes a good documentary, I suppose, is that it's, uh, it's true but it also is one that um, people connect with. They, they, they see themselves or they see their potential selves when uh, other people are struggling with issues. It's still arresting to see the force of that kind of conviction and that kind of sheer articulation and, and, and immediate people being able to express themselves in that way that we don't see now. I mean, you see somebody in the soundbite now they're just sort of smiling and saying what they think people want to hear. And this is a movie about really dynamically expressed ideas that cannot be reduced to sound bites. It comes out of a real life situation. And that's really what um, the magic and, and the, the wonder of uh, a film is all about. Anybody who looks at this film, I would almost say even if they're not willing, will be touched by it because of the humanity of everybody in the film. And I mean everybody in the film. 
this Missouri Lutheran thing came in the house the other day. They, quote, they start out by quoting Martin Luther, here I stand, that he takes a stand. And then it goes on talking, in the experience of every child of God, there comes a time when the, you must take the one alone stand against the, the stand the world has taken. Where are you going to meet this? You're going to meet it on the college campus, you're going to meet it on the streets, on the factory, and guess where else? You're going to meet it in your church. And what must you do? You must take the stand. It's still a great piece of filmmaking. It's still ex exciting to see because when you watch the movie, you're watching these ideas at play and people trying to get their best intentions across. And in some cases, they're trying to do that so forcefully that they're actually not hearing what's being said. And there's this great feeling of watching a nation and a people in transition, which makes for great drama. In our congregation, you could change a lot of people's attitudes just by getting to know them. Your church is 100 years old, Bill, is that right? I, I, all I'm saying, Earl, all I'm saying, Earl, is that we have 1,200 white people that don't even know any Negroes, or very few of them do. When that church returns to where it should have been in the first place, that is the day that I will walk back into the church. I will give my life to the church. I said, love is my premise. Yes.